The other day, someone asked, have we ever made a fruit punch mead? And I said, no, but it got me thinking, I want to make a fruit punch wine. Pow! I did not see that coming. Okay, so to do this, really, really simple. We're going to use a little big mouth bubbler because we're going to be making a slightly more than one gallon batch. And I know this holds realistically one and a half gallons. They say 1.4, but really it's 1.5. So what I want to do first is get our juices in there. Now, there was some debate as to what makes a fruit punch. There are so many different variables of how to make a fruit punch because basically it's two or more different types of fruit juices put together equals punch. Yes, yeah. that's the actual definition. I looked it up. So some of the things that we knew we wanted were pineapple. Let me find the pineapple. Pineapple. Let's read the ingredients. This is Lakewood pure pineapple. Pineapple juice, which is, it's from concentrate, water and pineapple juice concentrate. That's it. That's it. No other ingredients, no nothing in there. So this is all good. And I'm just going to shake this up because all the good stuff on the bottom of the jar, you want that in there. And we're just going to open it and pour that right in sloppy and everything. Oxygenating is good at this point. We want to do that. And if you think I'm going to throw this bottle like I usually do, not going to happen. <laughs> now we know our juice is perfectly safe because we have never opened it. It's direct right. from the store. It, you heard the little pop when you opened it. So they are it. sanitized. They are, I believe they pasteurize them, don't they? Probably, yeah. Um, and then we know all of our equipment is good to go because it's all been sanitized in the red bubble sanitization. See, She's setting herself I set up set myself here. up now. And many of the juices called for um, a body, like a filler, that was orange juice or apple juice. We saw one that said pear, and I was like, I want pear. The reason I didn't want to go with orange or apple is because orange tends to take a long time to age out, or it leaves a funky flavor. And, and I, I don't like it. Yeah, and she doesn't like the taste of fermented orange. So we thought, let's leave that out. Although we are going to have an orange hint in some ways. Um, Apple, a lot of times come with ascorbic acid. So does pear, but I thought pear is a little milder of a flavor than apple. Um, this does actually contain some ascorbic acid, but I figure it's only one of the four juices we're adding. Probably not a big deal. Here's to hoping. So I'm shaking it up. So this is pear juice, and this is R.W. Nudson. Okay. And in it goes. It just sounds so violent when you do that. So are these all the same? These are ounces? all 32 fluid ounces or one quart. Okay. And then I want this to be red. Okay. To me, fruit punch should be red. I'm thinking like the Hawaiian tropical fruit punch thing. I can't even think of the name of it now. Hawaiian punch. Hawaiian yeah. Punch. Duh. Um, <laughs> that one, you know, something like that. And yes, we could have just purchased Hawaiian punch and tried to ferment it, but no. We wanted to use actual juices and do it better than that. Okay, so What's I have... What's the ingredients in this one? Oh, this one is uh, ingredient, cranberry juice. That's it, not even from concentrates, just pure cranberry juice. So that's kind of awesome. It's gonna color this beautifully. By the way, if you're wondering, yes, aeration or adding oxygen in the beginning of fermentation is a very good thing. That's why I'm doing it. It helps the yeast colony build up in the first stages of the fermentation process. Once they're done building up, then they move on to converting. So if you don't have enough aeration, they struggle to build a colony, which is where you get some of the uh, rotten egg smells and things like that. And last but certainly not least, I wanted another flavor in here, and I kept thinking cherry. I want cherry in this. So we got some Lakewood Pure Black Cherry. Now, when I read the ingredients of this one, this one is black, in parentheses, dark sweet cherry juice. Full stop. That's it. So, again, give it a shake. Any of that sediment that's at the bottom, that could be like, you know, a little bit of extra nutrients for things and, you know, possibly more flavors. So why waste it? You paid for it anyway. It could also include natural tannins from the fruit itself. That too. So here we go. Now, I also wanted this because of the color. This is very dark. We have some lighter stuff in here already. So this should make a nice deep red fruit punch. <laughs> Can you play around with volumes and different juices? Of course you can. Absolutely. It's just going to be different from what we're making today. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
already we can see this has a lovely reddish color. Now, some other things that we want to add. First, I have some black tea. It's a nondescript brand of black tea because whatever brand I use, somebody always tells me I used, I should have used this brand. So I'm using a nondescript brand of black tea. This is a non-flavored black tea. It's black tea flavored black tea, if you must know. If you really want to use a flavored tea, you can just know you're changing this. It's not the same. This is here for the tannic aspect, that mouth puckering, uh, richness in the mouth feeling. That's what this is for. This is tannins. If you want to use the powder that does powder tannin, do that instead. We just went with the tea this time to keep things simple. So how much volume do we have of that? Okay, the volume of water doesn't matter, but okay. this is actually about eight ounces or one cup. It doesn't matter as far as extraction of the tea goes, but it does matter for the total for the full volume. volume here. Here. Right. So I used one tea bag in eight ounces of liquid. So this is eight ounces, and I use the small Pyrex because it fits right inside, so I can't spill it. Well, I, I can just <laughs> it'll spill inside the container. Um, this is a semi-optional ingredient, though I like to use it in everything. It's called Fermade O, and it is a yeast nutrient. What it does is it helps the yeast to not struggle so much if they might have struggled due to lack of nutrients. A lot of people seem to think that yeast just needs sugar, which technically they do, but they won't make it taste good. So they need other things to help so that they can push through and be very happy and uh, successful in their conversion to alcohol. So I just have here a little tiny bit of water and 2.5 grams of Fermade O. Okay, at this point, we have a lovely mixture of juices, some yeast nutrient, and some tea. And we also have absolutely no idea what the gravity level or the specific gravity for our reading could be. So it's time to take one. Notice I did that before I added other things. We have a couple other things going in here still, but I wanna get the reading so that I know how much sugar to add, that sort of thing. Now it's all gonna be estimation because we do actually have over a gallon here. So my usual, it's 0 0.046 gravity per pound of sugar in a gallon. It's gonna be less than that because we have more than a gallon. That is looking like fruit punch to me. It certainly is. I'm thinking this is gonna be somewhere in the 1.040 to 1.050 range, just cause that's usually what most juices are and we diluted it slightly. And what do you know, it's 1.048. Do you want to take a note of that? It doesn't really matter okay. because I'm looking for somewhere around a 1.100. So I'm going to add like a pound of sugar. That's, that's why I did that reading just to kind of see like, are we at 1.070 or 1.020? And we're at roughly 1.050. So I know if I add a pound, I'm going to be in that 1.100 ballpark range. Okay. So I just poured that back in because everything here was sanitized. So it's all clean. And now, we're gonna add a couple other flavor enhancements. Do you wanna do the sugar first so that way you can take a reading without getting these getting in the way? Because yeah, they're sure. not gonna affect the reading. So I have our scale that works better for the heavier weights. Yeah, our, our nicer scale doesn't doesn't seem to work this. This, this one goes second. up to 50 pounds. Now the other we, one goes to eleven. We intentionally purchase all of our equipment through the internet. So that way we can share with you links of the stuff we're actually using. Unfortunately, this particular scale is no longer available on Amazon. Really? So yeah. So I've been trying to find simulant scales to help you with the heavier uh, poundage, but basically you can click any of our links in the description below. And if you aren't satisfied with that particular item, you can continue to do a search to refine to yep. find something better. And we still get our our bonus of getting you to Amazon. So right. thank you if you do choose that option. Yes. Okay, so because we're where I thought we were, I'm gonna do like 1.2 pounds, 1.25 pounds of sugar. So we're gonna end up with somewhere around a 1.100. Um, so let's go with that. One point Maybe I'll just do 1.2 pounds. That makes me happy. Okay, this scale does pounds and ounces. Not a, I'm already pouring it, so I can't think of what 0.2 pounds is gonna be. So instead I'm gonna do one pound, two ounces. I wanted a two in there, okay? Okay, so. All right, so we got our one pound, two ounces of sugar in there. I'm gonna take it off the scale and start mixing this up. You want to mix this good if you want an accurate gravity reading. Now I could just leave this, the yeast will get to it, but I won't actually know exactly where we started. I can have an estimate, but 
I always like to kind of know. And it's not just for calculating um, alcohols, to know, did we surpass what the yeast is capable of? Have we stalled? Have we finished? There's all sorts of things that you find out by using a hydrometer. Now, can you use a refractometer? Yes, just will require some extra calculation later on down the line once there's alcohol present. Also, if your beverage is cloudy, a refractometer isn't going to be as accurate. Is that really true though? Because we've, we've seen, well, I we, guess it depends. We had some we've seen severe both ways. That's right, we did. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Now, one nice thing about doing this in glass, or I guess that's what happened in plastic too, is you will hear the grit of the sugar. And what I want to do now is I, I stopped. Let it sit for a minute because there might have been some undissolved sugar floating around. It'll settle down to the bottom and then you'll be able to tell if it's not been yeah, dissolved. Yeah, there's a little bit, just a tiny bit. We're close though, we're very close. So my general rule of thumb, mix it until you think you're done and then mix for like two more minutes. So see you in two minutes. For you, it'll be about three seconds. Okay, so that's mixed as much as I care to mix it. Let's uh, remove the stirring paddle thing. And now we're gonna add a couple more ingredients. And now we're gonna take another reading. Yeah, we're gonna take a reading. See where it's at. See if it needs more sugar. This is our original gravity reading. So this is like the startup, the basis for the entire thing. Okay, so we're looking for you know, our target somewhere around 1.100. The closer to that, the better. I don't really wanna be a lot higher than that, but a few points lower is totally okay. And it looks like we are gonna be 1.092. So beautiful. If we do the math on that, which I can do that very, very easily and quickly for you. The math, if you wanted to know how much alcohol we're going to make, would be 1.092. Let's assume this goes dry. 1.000 minus 1.000 gives me 0 0.092. Multiply that by 135 and we get 12.4% ABV. Pretty respectable. But I have plans for this, so that doesn't even matter. More on that later in the video. But this can just go right back in. You notated it 1.092. She even put it in a fancy box. box. Yeah, she's getting all kinds of fancy on me. All right, so if you notice, Brian keeps going to these and he wants to put them in and I keep saying no. And the reason being is that they're not gonna add anything to our gravity, but they could possibly get in the way to us taking our reading. So right. that's why I was making him wait. And what we have here is this is a mandarin orange. Um, I've found that mandarin oranges tend to taste a little sweeter, a little bit better in fermentation. And we have found that the peels of citrus works far better than the actual juice or fruit itself. It doesn't take as long to ferment out. It doesn't leave that weird flavor. Uh, and it actually tastes really, really good very, very early on. So that's why I like to do it. And it also doesn't affect the acidity quite as much as right. like if you put a full lemon in there, that is certainly going to make it more acidic. And there is a pH range that makes yeast happy and we don't want to go too acidic on that. Right. So that's why the ascorbic acid is added to the pear because pear doesn't have the same acidity level. So in order to preserve freshness and color, they do that. By the way, bonus points if you can make it all in one piece. I don't know how that happened. It just kind of did. <laughs> And same for a lemon. This is just a regular Meyer lemon. And I am I think it's a Meyer lemon. It's just a lemon. Lemon. I don't know. I'm no lemon expert. <laughs> but what you do want is the skin, like the peel and not the pith. So you don't want to peel it too thick. Right. Because the pith, the white part. It's a little bitter. Can add a flavor that you're not looking for. And the pith police will come to your house and take your brew and you'll never be allowed to homebrew again. <laughs> Okay, so there we go. And people will always ask, did we sanitize these? We dunked them in turbos, okay, into the sanitizing solution, just to get off anything on the outside. But they were washed first, okay? They were, they're clean, and then we just dunked them just to make sure. But if you are thinking that you can sanitize fruit just by dunking it in there, no, because you're only getting what's on the outside, nothing on the inside. So if there's anything inside that fruit, dunking it in star sand is not going to work. Soaking it in star, star sand is not going to work. And if you puncture your fruit and soak it in star sand... Well, yeah, don't do that either. Don't do that either, yeah. All right, so all that's left is something to make this actually ferment because 
As far as we know, all those jars were probably pasteurized, so anything in there might not work, and I don't know that there would be enough yeast on these two fruits to actually ferment this, and in our experience, wild yeast has been a little bit inconsistent, so They've we... been wild. Yeah. Shocker, right? So we like to use a known quantity when we're doing this, and for this, I'm going with something that we're, we know very, very well, 71B. This is from Lalvin. It's uh, probably my favorite yeast to use of all time. It has anywhere from a 13 to 15% or so uh, ABV range, so that's how much alcohol it can make maximum before just saying, nope, we're done. Um, but in this case, we only have about 12.5%, so this should go completely dry. Let me reiterate what that means. The yeast has a 15% tolerance, right? That means it can make up to 15% alcohol. If there was enough sugar in here to make 18%, it's not going to, it's gonna make around 15 and leave sweetness in theory, but yeast can't read. 71B especially seems to be very not good at reading. <laughs> no, it doesn't listen. But what I'm getting at is if you don't have enough sugars to hit 15, it's just gonna go dry, okay? It doesn't still go to 15 because you need the sugars in order to make the alcohol without that it doesn't ever get there. And how much am I gonna use? The whole thing. Why am I doing that? Well, for one, yeast is pretty cheap, okay? Let's be honest. It's really not that expensive to get a packet of yeast. And I want a full viable colony. The more I break this down into smaller pieces, the less individual cells I have of yeast, which at a certain point, the amount of dead to the amount of alive makes for those cells really won't make a viable colony. They'll stress, they'll create off flavors, or they could stall and really ruin your day. They're just not gonna make it a fun time trying to ferment that. So it's important, make sure you do that. And I'm just going to, you know what? I'm not touching it. Every time I go to stir the yeast, it sticks somewhere, it gets to the walls of the, it, no, I'm not doing it. But we are gonna put a lid on this. We gotta clink. Clamp that thing down. That is one thing about the Little Big Mouth Bubbler. You do want to clamp it down really, really good. If you have a second person to help, that's a good thing. She's gonna stick the airlock in there first. Inside that airlock is sanitizer fluid straight out of turbos. If it overflows or you need to refill it, you can always use like a, a cheap um, neutral spirit. I mean, it doesn't have to be cheap. You can use expensive stuff, but why she would did. you? Yeah. yeah, I think you could. And um, the one that I like to use is Scoresby Scotch. Somebody the other day said it's kind of funny that Brian is still doing that. That's right. I haven't had Scoresby Scotch on the shelf in this house in almost two years, and I'm still saying it. It's just, I hate it that much. But anyway, so what are we going to do with this now? I'm gonna let it sit, but let me review my notes just to make sure that I've included everything that we've done thus far, because your notes are only as good as what you actually document. Yes. So I have the name of our beverage, which is fr Fruit Punch Wine. I have yep. today's date. I have 32 fluid ounces of pineapple juice, 32 fluid ounces of pear juice, 32 fluid ounces of cranberry juice, and 32 fluid ounces of black, bear black cherry juice. Yep. I have 2.5 grams of Fermate O. Yep. I have eight ounces of black tea. Yep. I have a pound and two ounces of sugar. Yep. I have the zest of one lemon and the zest of mandarin, one mandarin orange and wonderful package of Lalvin 71B. Sounds like she got everything. So we're gonna set this aside. We're gonna put it on a, a tray, like a cooking tray that has a lip, just in case it overflows, decides to start going everywhere. It but we do have mess. a good amount of headroom yeah, it's that fine. we're probably going to be safe, but better safe than sorry. And there's no bag. There's no, like if we had used whole fruit and put it in a bag, there's a chance the bag could inflate, get up in here and cause some issues that way. So using juice makes that a little bit easier. Um, it does take away some of your ability to choose the exact fruits you want. But hey, the convenience aspect more than makes up for it, especially for a simple beginner style recipe such as this. So this will go in the fermentation station and we'll see you once it um, needs its first check. So we are about seven days into this now and I would just like to point something out. When we put this away, we thought, oh, there's plenty of room. It's gonna be great, no problem. Yeah, we put it right into the fermentation station. No tray, no nothing. The next day, Derica walks in the room and goes, uh, what's that noise? Brian? <laughs> it had gone up over the airlock. It was starting to fill the basin in here. So we caught it in time, but that just goes to show you how much headspace it can actually take up when it's a happy fermentation. Well, how happy is it? We don't know, because the airlock kind of stopped and it's been seven days, so I'm a little worried. 
Let's find out. But it could be done. Happy yeast, you know? Right now it smells like fermented fruit juice. It does. It actually smells nice. Which, shockingly enough... It smells like wine. It smells like fruit punch. what we were aiming for. It smells like fruit punch wine to me! <laughs> it looks shockingly like another thing that we've been fermenting that didn't work out quite this well. Well, it's not nearly as radioactive in hue. No, it doesn't need batteries. <laughs> It looks like fruit punch. Every time um, okay, I had fruit I, punch. I was afraid that it stalled. It did. It did not. It it did its thing quite thoroughly. <laughs> Maybe a little too thoroughly. No, that's good. We want it to go. Uh, I, I know. It's just. Okay. I just, I just want to point something out. This started at 1.092. It has literally been seven days. We started this on May 23rd. Today is May 30th. It is at 1.000. I think the beast felt bad because it, it had a little iffy moments there before. And so it's like, no, I'm still the beast. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. Boom. All right. I'm going to get a glass. You know why? I need a taste of this. I just want to see if we're on the right track. For science. It's not fully cleared. Like there's still a lot of... Uh... I'm not sure it's ever going to fully clear. Oh, I think it will. And all the fruit punch I've ever had in my youth was, was cloudy, messy, gunk. Right. But see, we have some options. So let's let's just experiment this. It, it see, smells see. it smells like teen spirit. It's got some youth in there. Never understood that. What does teen spirit smell like? Because I was a teen too, and it, it wasn't a good smelling time. I do smell a, a raw fermentation, like a, it's still a new fermentation. But there's a lot of fruitiness behind it too. It's got the right flavor components. Yeah. It tastes like fruit punch. The problem it with really that does. for me is I don't like fruit punch. Oh, I do. <laughs> um, but it's not sweet. This is very, very dry. Yep. It's actually lightly, lightly carbonated right now. Yeah, it's got that. Um, a little effervescent. Yeah. Not in a good way. I'm actually I, not opposed to this being sparkling uh, for a long term, for when we finish. Okay. We and hadn't actually thought of that. We that's hadn't, not a bad idea. but we've had people ask, can you do a sparkling wine? Maybe. And because it's not a mead, we don't need to worry about honey character at the end. Yeah. Because this fermented in one week and it's not clear yet, I'm tempted to add something. Or do you want to just let it sit for a week and see what happens? Um, I'm okay with, with adding some pectic enzyme. Yeah, I don't, that's what I, I don't see the enzyme. Arm. Okay, let me grab some. Right. If you're curious what pectic enzyme is, it's actually a naturally occurring enzyme that is used by a lot of things, animals and bacteria and whatever, to break down fruits. And that's probably not the most scientific answer, but that's the general gist of what it is. So it's not like some crazy weird thing. It's naturally occurring. Um, it's actually in a lot of foods already. We are just going to use a half teaspoon of this, and I need something to start. Oh, I, I can start with the... Uh, which we'll call it the baster. master baster. And I'm just going to put half teaspoon in and I'm going to mix that, mix that around. It tends to clump. Now I'm trying not to add oxygen. Okay. I'm just mixing. Right. Again, we wouldn't always worry about absolute clarity because it doesn't really change the flavors. But my concern is because this finished in one week with fermentation, I thought this is why it's so cloudy. Let's show them a way to Clear it ahead Absolutely. of time. You could also just leave this for a couple of weeks and it'll probably clear yeah. on its own. Oh, so what is that in there? <laughs> it's just, just the peels. Oh yeah, we're seeing <laughs> stuff floating in there. I just saw it too. I was like, what is <laughs> that? We have a Loch Ness monster in there. <laughs> it's a mandarin orange peel. <laughs> it had the neck thing. I was like, what the heck? We know Loch Ness the, the, the trick is if you have stuff floating in there, you want to make sure that it's submerged. And it all is more or less underwater. Nessie was, did not have her head out of the liquid. <laughs> Glad you find that so funny. Okay, I'm going to hold this while you tighten it. Anyway, what pectic enzyme does is it helps to break down some of the pectin that is in a lot of these fruits naturally. Which so, causes the lack of clarity. Yep. And it'll clump it all together and they'll fall out of suspension. Let's take a note that we've added the pectic enzyme. And it usually takes a few days to a week to do its job. And you can see the little bit of stirring, we've already upset the situation, so we're getting some increased off-gassing going on. So that may help things as well. Bring there we go. Push the envelope. Now we got off-gassing. As he likes to do. When in doubt, gas is out. <laughs> I like that's a t-shirt. Oh, that's just, no. <laughs> Multiple levels, too. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you noticed how delicate he was in sturdiness. And now with the lid and airlock in place, he's not being so delicate. Because no oxygen's getting in it. That's being that he is pushing the CO2 out of liquid. CO2 is heavier than oxygen. So any oxygen that may have been in there is now being pushed out through the airlock. And this void is being filled with CO2. Therefore, no problemo. You probably noticed too that I started out gently until the airlock really started going. Then I gave it a little bit more mileage. Right, because you don't know how much of the gas is trapped in solution until you start doing this. Well, also too, there was there was a layer of air in there. And so until that got pushed out, sure. I didn't want to, you know. But mix sometimes it in. it'll surprise you. You do oh, a, yeah. a gentle swirl, <laughs> like all chaos will go go on. <sighs> All right, so what are we gonna do now? We're gonna put the note back on it, and then what are we gonna do with it? We're gonna let it sit. See you in another week or two. So this was started two weeks ago. Seven days ago, we took a reading and it was at 1.000. We added some pectic enzyme to help it clear. I'm not sure if it did a whole lot for but it. there is a good sediment layer. It's... Yeah, and somebody shook it up yesterday. I'm not saying who. It settled out quite nicely though. Okay, we do the optical and smelling. It looks pretty. It does, it looks really, really good. We're gonna take our second reading. Now we do this to make sure it is actually finished fermenting because if you only have one, is it done? Is it not quite done? You know, it, it was at 1.000. So the reasonable assessment is that it's finished, but we've seen things go below 1.000. So we want to make sure. And if you understand the science behind this, 1.000 is the reading of water, right. but alcohol is below water. 0. So. 0.790, as a matter of fact, significantly below water. Yeah. So depending on how much alcohol is in there, it could go below 1.000 easily. Um, this sort of almost did. I mean, if I look real hard, it's, it's 0.998, but here's my thinking. I don't think it's gonna go much further if it goes at all. At this point, it's a reasonably safe thing to do to rack it. We also know we're going to rack it to a vessel that we're going to put under airlock. So just in case Even it decides it to points. continue, yeah. we're still in a safe environment. Notice I am pouring the sample back in, but into the new fermenter it's going into because if I poured it back in there, it could disrupt the lease. And well, that means we can't rack today. Kind of impressed though, two weeks in and we're already racking this. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's nice. All right, so to rack is just the way we always do it. Auto siphon, always, we always use an auto siphon. Some people have had problems with auto siphons. I personally think they're amazing. Source remains a table height while destination is going to go down into my lap. And we put the tube all the way into the bottom. That way there's no splashing. I am leaving the cap on because there's a good head of lease in there. Yeah, it's about to this Tail level. of lease, I don't know, bottom of lease. And I'm just gonna put it about halfway down and get that started and move this as it goes lower. I don't wanna just dunk it all the way into the bottom there. Even though this is the first racking, it will settle out. I wanna keep as much of the lease in here as I possibly can. Okay, we racked it, and we racked it to a slightly smaller container. That way, we keep the minimal amount of headspace. Now, don't get crazy about headspace, but if you see that you have like this much brew in this big of a container, you might want to consider a smaller container. Just saying. So we're gonna put that on there, and yes, I just smacked my elbow off the table, and it hurt. Thank you very much. And it's holding, but I don't trust it. So I'm gonna take one of these broccoli rubber bands. That's what they're from. From broccoli. <laughs> from broccoli. We have a bunch of them. And I'm gonna put that on there in the strategic manner that it holds the bun in place. Now, why are we doing this? That's a good question. Let me answer that question for you. This is a size number seven bung, and I believe- Of the, which we have far too many. I believe the proper size of bung for this vessel is a 6.5, which- can you tell we're on the B team bungs, people? I mean, it's slightly smaller, but it's still small enough that it makes a difference. Yeah, that one actually is holding, but uh, hey, you know, a little extra insurance doesn't hurt. Come don't super glue it on. No. Somebody said they do that. Don't do that, and don't go to Amazon and type in number six point seven bung because six point five. Thank you, because there is a situation in bung sizes. And I found this out the hard way. 
they have a different numeration. Oh my God, there's different measuring systems for them? Yeah, yeah. So there are 6.5s for the one gallon and there are 6.5s for like a five gallon. And I'm gonna start putting duct tape over it and poking a hole. They're different. This is insane. Um, don't do that, don't, please don't no, do that. don't do that. I, I'm joking. Um, so it's, it's slightly irritating when you're trying to find the right bung for your vessel. And I know I've said bung a lot of times and people probably, if you're like me, are thinking of cornholio and there's TP for your bunghole. Let's not encourage that. Uh, we're not gonna encourage that because it makes Brian really angry. I have to answer the comments, you know. So let's be nice and consider. Let's be older than six. <laughs> Just say. So anyway, what are we gonna do with this now? We're gonna let it sit. Because I scooped up a little bit of lease. Because <laughs> I was trying to fill this so that we didn't have much much headspace. Uh -huh. So what's going to happen is this is going to sit for a week, maybe two weeks. It's going to settle out. It's probably not going to clear much more. This is going to be a darker colored brew, but it is actually clear. That's the thing. It's just dark colored, so you can't see through it. And we'll be back to show you what it does next. So another week's gone by and well, it's time to finish this thing up. So let's uh, get it into a pitcher. We're going to taste this, sweeten it, and then we're going to add some fizz. Because why not, you know? Sparkly wine. It's not champagne, because we're not in France, but it's sparkling wine. It's not white either. It's not white. Or, Champagne's yellow. Or rose, rosé, pink. I don't get that particular. <laughs> it's fruit punch. Okay, so a whole bunch of stuff actually settled out. So yes. I'm going to leave the cap on. Whoa. Can you tell everything was sanitized? I'm going to leave the cap on just in case so that I don't suck up any of that into our uh, pitcher. So, here's what we're going to do. We are going to sweeten this and then prepare it for carbonation. But oh, first... A taste. Just little ones, because, well, I'm going to have to take another measurement of how much we got when we're done. Okay, I smell a little bit of young funk on it, but not a lot. It's very berry forward. What? <laughs> so, by young funk, he means there is an aroma due to the off-gassing process that is more prevalent in the youthful stage of a brew. That's what young, young funk means. Yeah. It's young and funky. <laughs> it's not It's not really that funky. I haven't tasted it yet. Now, this is very dry, 0.998. And the, the, the pineapple cranberry, they're both very tart yeah. and acidic. So with the extra dryness, you're kind of like... Yeah. <laughs> it's, young and fun it's young and funky. It's not unpleasant. It's no, just... it's really not. It's it's very tart, and I think it needs a pretty good amount of sweetness to really bring those flavors out. Because we did pineapple, pear, cranberry, and black cherry. I'm getting a little bit of pineapple, but not a lot. Pineapple really needs sweetness, or else it doesn't work. Cranberry can actually be dry and be okay. I'm yeah. getting a lot of cranberry. Not much on the pear, but the pear was there just for overall body. Yeah. And black cherry... Kinda, not really coming through, not sure. We'll wait and see. If you look at lots of fruit juice mixes, even things that are labeled as a specific fruit juice, you may oh, yeah. find that I actually have a larger percentage of either pear, apple, or grape juice. Not the ones we use. As a base. I'm just saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, many juices say that, like and, the Aldi ones. And the reason being is those three juices can easily be overtaken by other flavors so they work well as like a, a filler juice so you can still have 100 percent natural juice just not the, the juice you think it is you're saying it is now when it comes to sweetening you have a multitude of options okay the, at its most basic you could just take some sugar you dump it in there until you like the sweetness level but then you have to pasteurize or stabilize in some way since we want to carbonate that complicates things. I know in the past we've done it and played the game of letting it carbonate just enough before we pasteurize. I don't really think that's a great way to go anymore, so we're going to do something a little bit different. One way to guarantee that you get the sweetness you want and you get the carbonation is to use a non-fermentable sugar, like allulose. We did a test on allulose, erythritol, and white sugar, and I think we actually chose allulose over white sugar in flavor. I think um, it was kind of divided, but allulose and white sugar taste the most similar to yeah. each other, where erythritol did create a sweetness, but it kind of had a weird 
I mean, Other it's this different, plants. okay? Yeah. The erythritol is pretty good. A lot of people like to use it, but we found the allulose actually tasted like I think I chose it instead of the sugar. Like I was trying to guess what they have that stupid spoon in there. Um, I think I was trying to figure out which one was the real sugar, and I think I chose allulose. Yeah, so. I believe so. Um, so anyway. Allulose, depending on where you're at, can be slightly more expensive than erythritol or some of your other non-fermentable sugars. So take that in consideration if you have budgetary requirements. Um, but for us, it is our preferred. Yeah. If we're going to use a non-fermentable, this is what we like to use. Now, how do we sweeten? Our way, which means dump a bunch in, controlled amount, <laughs> mix it up, taste it, see if you like it. If not, move forward. Now, the trick is don't put too much at one time. Now, I also know that allulose is only about 70%. It's like 68% as sweet as sugar. So basically, I need like one and a half times the allulose that I would normally use in sugar. I think I want this to be fairly sweet. So that looked like, I don't even know by weight what this is, but didn't look like a lot, but it's a good starting point. And people always ask, well, how do you know how much? I really don't. don't. I'm guessing but I don't want to guess too high. I know I want this to be fairly sweet. I know it's really dry right now. So you can put in some, try again. If you want to use the cup measurement thing, do like half a cup to start. See if that's enough. You can always add more, but once it's in there, you can't take it out. Another thing we really enjoy about Iolos is it dissolves beautifully. Yep, it's already gone. Like it's it's done. And I think it's there. because- It's a fine it's powder. It's a really fine powder, yeah. Still smells exactly the same. I don't even detect the sweetness. Hmm. Yeah. Needs more. I do detect the sweetness, but it definitely needs more. Okay. And when we have tasting days or days like this where we're doing back sweetening or changing the flavor profile and we do multiple tastings, I always end up to be slightly more intoxicated than Brian once the day is complete. And he always wonders, why is that? We're not drinking that much. And if you noticed... She finishes the then, glass. And if you look back at our other tastings, we both take a taste and then I empty the glass. So there you go. By choice. <laughs> but yeah, that happens. I think there's a difference in tolerance level too, though. I, I'm fairly certain I have a higher tolerance than you. Yes. Well, we, we also did research on that, and there's biological reasons. Our cats are going a little crazy today, so if you hear any loud bang or anything, it's Inigo and Rascal running around. Even if you don't hear a loud bang, because Brian does really well with getting rid of the extraneous noises and the um, audio edits, if you see us flinch or kind of look weirdly, it's just, it's cats. Cranberry's still very prominent. Mm. I think it still needs more, but it's getting there. Mm -hmm. Yes, this really is how we do it. If you've ever watched any of our videos, this is how we do it. And I recommend doing it this way, especially in the very beginning when you're just starting out, because that way you get a real feel for what you like. And if you take a gravity reading at the end, just to see how much sugars you added, what range you tend to prefer, that will aid you in future brews because you will know what your taste difference are Roughly. to ours, and so you can make adjustments ahead of time mentally. Yes. Um, it's almost there. I think it's it's a combination of the youth and the pineapple. It's very acidic. Yeah. And that might just simply age out, so it's going to be hard to get it where we want right now. Nope. I'm going to do it. <laughs> or just keep adding sugar. It's not sugar. It needs significant amount of sweetness for that cranberry note. And it's very acidic, very harsh, and I want to fix that. What does that look like? <laughs> I have found when I whenever I sweeten with allulose, like whether I put it in coffee or anything, I need a lot more than I think I do. Like that whole 70% thing, I think it's more like 30%. But that's just my experience. That also could be a, a mental trick because you know with sugar, you're increasing the caloric intake, and in your case, some other factors. And so you're like, okay, that's sweet enough because I don't want to push that's it. That's possible, yeah. But with allulose, you're like, oh, there's no calories here. There's... It's 
pretty darn close. Maybe it's just, just a little. Yeah, I think it's just the, the end note where the, the tartness is most present. Now, before anybody goes crazy thinking we just put a whole ton of allulose in there, that's a three pound bag. It was a partial bag when I started. It doesn't feel that much lighter than when I started. So I maybe put in a pound of allulose, which if it's 70% should be something like 30 points of gravity. But we will much. be taking gravity reading oh, yeah. once we're complete with this process, because even though it's a non-fermentable sugar, it's still going to affect the gravity. I think that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think with some carbonation, that's gonna be actually quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, so we are good there. So let me get a number here, 128, 26, 122, 122 ounces now. So what do we got to do now? Take a gravity reading. We're going to get a gravity reading. That means I need gravity reading equipment. All right. Okay. So at this point in the show, usually I make a guess as to what I think the gravity might be. This time it's hard because allulose doesn't go the same way as sugar. So it's going to taste sweeter than the gravity would suggest, or it's, is it the other way around? I, I think recall. it's going to... I think it's the other way around. I don't even know. <laughs> but I'm going to make a prediction anyway. 1.018. <laughs> I'm going to make a prediction too. What? 42. Yeah. All right. This is going to be interesting. Let me do this this way. Look at that. I think I'm a little off. Did you hear that? Yeah, I'm a little bit off. Like a lot. 1.034. I think it actually changes more than the sweetness would, because this doesn't taste anything like 1.034. But anyway, that is what we got. 1.034. And you know what? There's no calories in it, so who cares? I mean, you know, that's kind of a flippant attitude, but you know what I mean. So I'm going to pour this back in carefully. Don't touch the sides. Well, actually, you want to touch the sides so that it doesn't like splash. Okay, next we're going to carbonate this and bottle. Now we're going to use natural carbonation. What that actually means is a pre-measured amount of sugar, actual sugar, not non-fermentable, put in here, mixed up so that it goes completely through. And then we bottle that. That way we know there's a, an, an there's a measured amount of sugar in every bottle so that it can ferment, produce CO2 or gas and carbonate it, but it also produces a little bit of alcohol. Now, my preferred method is to use 28 ounces of sugar. If you go online and use one of the calculators, you will see a wide range that is considered safe for carbonation. We find this to be a good all around. If you like a little bit more carbonation, you can go with like one and a half times this much. If you like less carbonation, I don't know that I'd want to go that low, but if you like less carbonation, you can go like three quarters as much or so, and you'll be just fine. Now, an easy way to get this to mix is not the way I did this. Hold on a second. So what we have here is just a Pyrex container, and I'm just going to pour like a couple of the juice into here or so. It doesn't even have to be measured. It's not that important. I'm going to pour our sugar into that. And then I'm going to use the... Uh, now, this isn't the wuss. The wuss is unusually small size. This would be the, the wums, the whisk of medium small size. <laughs> Everything has a name. It makes you remember things and just mix it up. The idea here is it's easier for me to, to mix that sugar in fully here than it is in there. Now, I've done it in the past using warm water. That works really well. But people have said, oh, but you're diluting. Yeah, a little bit. So today I'm using the wine itself. That way... People can't tell me that I'm diluting it. But I know somebody's going to say, but now I'm oxidizing it. Guess what? That's homebrew. There's always something that's going to happen. And you just have to decide what risk you're willing to take. That sounded much more fatalistic than it actually is. But you know what I mean? I made us both lattes just before filming. The caffeine's just starting to kick in. on This isn't alcohol. This is caffeine. We haven't even had anything to drink other than the few sips of this, yeah. which for you is like a whole bottle. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> you drank all the rest of what was left. You want to make sure that every grain is consumed. And the reason why you have to use real sugar is because non-fermentable sugar obviously doesn't ferment. So it won't actually make carbonation. 
And you cannot do this if you've surpassed the tolerance of your yeast. Like in this case, we used Lalvin 71B. 71B can go to 14, 15, we've even seen 16 and 17% from it. So the fact that it's a 12.6 and it went totally, totally dry means it's still got, still got some room to go. So uh, it should be fine. Just a couple of little grains left in there. Come on, you can do it. All right, I think we're good. And now I wanna pour this just right into that pitcher and then we're going to give it a quick little mix just to make sure that it's homogenous. See now what has happened is all that sugar is now equally distributed through the must. The old fashioned way and less safe way in my opinion is to take a teaspoon of sugar and put it into every bottle. Now, if you can measure a teaspoon exactly to the milligram every single time, then feel free to do that. However, I have a feeling most of us can't do that. I know I can't do it. So you'd be putting more in this one, less in that one, more in that one, less in that one. If you were way off, it could be really bad and catastrophic because a teaspoon is quite a bit. We're only gonna have eight bottles here, but a teaspoon in each bottle, I'm pretty sure it comes out to more than 28 grams, which means you should have a very, very high amount of carbonation to begin with. And if you put in a little too much, well, bad things happen. Okay, what's next? It's time to bottle. Right, we're gonna put this in bottles. Putting it in bottles is the same thing as siphoning. We just put it into bottles instead of into another fermenter. So. We use a bottle wand. Yeah, and we use a bottling wand to do it. <laughs> I'll put a link in the description below of our full bottling process. Yeah, so we're gonna bottle these and we'll be back when we're done. All right, bottled. We got seven full bottles and then this one right here, that's only half full. What are we gonna do with the half full one? We're gonna drink it. Yeah, pretty much. You wanna drink that one right away. Now, there's a lot of controversy as to whether it would be dangerous to try to carbonate that or not. I like to play it safe. I was told it's dangerous. So, hey, you know, we get to drink like, you know, eight ounces of the wine early. So what? The other seven go into what we affectionately refer to as the bomb shelter. It's literally a plastic tote from Lowe's, which would be like your home improvement store. But if you don't have a Lowe's, you know, some people don't know what Lowe's is. So it would just be one of those plastic totes with a big heavy lid. And we put these in there and we let them sit for like a week to two weeks. And then we pull them out. Why do we put them in there? We put them in there just in case something goes amiss. There may be a default on one of our bottles that we are unaware of, and the additional pressure made up from the carbonization process could make that bottle rupture. If it is an enclosed surface container that can contain that perhaps rupture, then it's not gonna be all over our floor, it's not gonna be embedded into our bodies, and it won't be embedded into our cat's bodies either. Right. It might make a mess, but it won't be dangerous. That's the key. So, you know, we do the best we can. We're probably not going to ever have a bottle bomb with these because we've done everything as correctly as we possibly can. But you know what? That little extra bit of insurance doesn't hurt and I suggest you do something similar. Cardboard, by the way, does not stop flying glass. This stuff explodes very violently and does really fly very deep, very, very fast. I have seen pictures of it embedded in sheetrock that far in. And in the ceiling. And in ceilings. It's kind of crazy. And that's like five to 10 feet away, still embedded in the wall. That would do a job on uh, skin, you know, just saying. All right, so we will be back once these are carbonated and we will give you our final thoughts on them then. See you then. All right, it's been sitting for two weeks in the fermentation station and then uh, one day in the fridge actually <laughs> to get it cold. There's a reason why you make things cold when they're carbonated. A, they tend to taste a little better and B, it holds the carbonation in so that you don't have an eruption, yeah. Trust me, you don't want this everywhere. But hey, you know what? We got to find out. Did it carbonate at all? Let's find out right now. I don't think it carbonated. Now, there's a few reasons why it might not have. It could have been too close to the alcohol percentage of the, uh, the tolerance of the yeast, or our yeast had just called it quits. They were just too dormant. Either way, it's a perfectly fine beverage. It's a little disappointing. Yeah, there's no carbonation. None. So if you find yourself in this situation and you really, really totally had your heart set on carbonation, there are other methods, primarily forced carbonation, where you can say, yeast, we don't care about you, we're gonna make carbonated anyway. Right, you could totally do that. 
could probably also do what we call insurance yeast, where you just take a few grains of yeast and you drop them into the bottle. That might have helped. Um, off camera, Derica did ask me about that, and I said, that nah, should be fine. We're good. Well, you know, you win some, you lose some. That is the downside to natural carbonation. Sometimes it just doesn't take. Now, that's this bottle. Some of the other bottles might have actually carbonated. That's the weird part is sometimes yeah. they do, sometimes they don't. But hey, we're gonna give you an idea of what it tastes like. Also, this is fruit punch wine. So if you didn't wanna do any of those things, but you still wanted to have a light carbonated beverage, you could totally mix this with some seltzer water or other sure. carbonated yeah. neutral This is 13%. Thing, and you'd be good to go. 13% and it's a 1.034, but remember we used allulose and there's a little bit of priming sugar in this. So there's allulose and sugar in it. The color is beautiful. Yep, gorgeous it's color. Lovely ruby red. It smells like fruit punch. The aroma smells like fruit punch. The young funk that I smelled earlier is kind of gone. I don't really get that. Yeah, I'm getting more fruit punch wine. Yep. Shocker, because this is wine, yay. Oh, that's just nice. I really do wish it was carbonated. It'd be that much better but it's really nice. You get the tang of the cranberry. I can definitely taste the dark cherry. Um, pear is kind of, it's a body thing, so you don't really get much of it. Right, and we already discussed that, that yeah. in this video. Do you get a little punch kind of, of the a, pineapple. A baseline. Yeah. Um, it comes across as mostly cherry and cranberry yeah. with a little hint of pineapple. Yep, yep, I would agree. Mm. There's citrus in there too, though. Just a touch of orange. A little lemon from the peels that we had in there. Mm -hmm. It's just all around really nice. Um, very, it's very bright and acidic. It's got a nice uh, refreshing. Yeah. It's got that tart, fruity punch. Yep. But and it's got enough I don't sweetness mean punch to. Punch like a mixed beverage. I mean, punch like <laughs> punch. <laughs> but it's got enough sweetness to come back from some of that acidity, too. So it doesn't just <laughs> taste like, you know, something that wants to burn your face off. No, no, my face is completely intact. I do wish it carbonated. And I know everybody in the comments is going to have a million reasons why it didn't or what we could have done, and that's totally okay. Um, we do take suggestions and comments to heart when we can, as long as they're not harsh and mean. You know, call, call us stupid. I'm probably going to not take too well to that comment. Now, if you are a longtime viewer and you have been paying attention to our comment or our content, we tend to take a scenario such as this where things didn't turn out exactly the way we wanted them to, and we turn that around into a learning lesson. So. What did we learn from this? In the future, you may see this beverage again in a different video. Spoilers. You know what I learned? Cut out the part where we said we were gonna naturally carbonate and then just show it as a wine. <laughs> see, then we didn't mess up. We don't do that. You know, we said we were going to make this carbonated. We tried. It didn't work. But like Derek said, use a soda stream. You can add it to just some straight up like carbonated water. There's a lot of ways to do it. You can keg it. There's tons of ways to do it. We just, we didn't know this wasn't carbonated until we opened the bottle on camera. So yeah, we're just as we're, surprised we're as you. Putting it out there. We're just as disappointed as you are. Walking on the line. Honestly though, it's really nice the way it is. I'm not offended yeah, by it. Yeah, it's, it's difficult for me to say that I'm disappointed. Am I disappointed? Oh, it's totally not disappointed because it didn't come out the way I wanted right. it to do it. But flavor wise, I'm enjoying the heck out of this. Oh, yeah. This is, this is pretty nice. My history with fruit punch is, is not spotty it, at best. Lackluster, if you will. I'm not a fan. But this, I am enjoying. It's kind of reminding me. It's like an adult version of It's like fruit punch. shades of sangria. Yeah. Which is weird. I adore sangria, but I don't like fruit punch. How, yeah. how is that a thing? I don't know. This is almost like an adulter version. Adulter? Adulter. It's a, a more grown-up version of a fruit punch. It has that acid and a little bit of a tannic property that's really, really nice. I'm pretty sure we used black tea in this. I can I can taste the, the, the feel of tannins in there. Yeah, it has all those things, but the, the tastes, the cranberry and the black cherry is a little different than most of your fruit punches. It yeah. doesn't taste like... It doesn't taste like Kool-Aid, in other words. <laughs> no, no, it's not or Hawaiian sickingly punch. sweet. It doesn't taste artificial. No. It tastes more pure to the different fruits represented mm. in here, mm -hmm. plus that wine element. Because you, you do taste, at least I am getting the 
the alcohol flavor, not so much the alcohol a bit, sensation. Like the tang of it, yeah. Right. Um, now, this ended up at 13. 13%. So if I drank enough of this, I'd probably get the You'd alcohol know. sensation as well. Um, but right now, I'm just really enjoying it. I, I really like the sharp, tart, yeah. bright notes in there. It's kind of a, a dessert-y thing. You know, like but an after dinner. But it's not type drink. it's not like really annoyingly sweet. No, no, it's not at all. Um see that's the thing. Everything is relative. We have seen people post I ended my brew at 1.060 and I could have gone sweeter. Depends on what was in it. We've done that. As a matter of fact, capsicumels. Whenever there's capsaicin and heat involved, I like them to be much, much sweeter. But it doesn't come across as sickly sweet or too heavily sweet. The, the most sickly sweet thing that we've made is probably the Kool-Aid wine. She didn't like it at all. To me, it brought me back to my childhood. So, you know, it was fine. It was too sweet for me, though. Like, way too sweet for me. But I felt, I, I associated with the flavors. This, nowhere near that sweet. Sometimes it's relative. I mean, there is sugar in it. Well, there's no sugar, really, but... Now there you, is sweetener in this. You were comparing this to a dessert wine as more of a, like an aperitif thing, like a, something that... Aperitif is before, digestif. Digestif. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had my okay. eves wrong. Yeah. Uh, gotta get your eves right. I gotta get my eves in the correct alignment. Uh, but for me, I could actually drink this with food. It to would me, be, it's strongly flavored to go with most Well, food. I'm thinking like... Cuban specific. And for me, in my mind, based on my personal experience of this one Cuban restaurant that my family adored and we'd always go there and, and the the guy who he he's just one of those you want to adopt him kind of gentleman. I and unfortunately I think he's passed away, but he would make these gorgeous dishes and he always had a little bit of fruit in everything. And so that's what I attribute in my head to differentiating Cuban food from Spanish or Mexican or other. Uh, I think there's more differences than just that, but I get I right. Get what but you're but in my head, that's where I'm like, okay, but there's those flavors with fruit, then it's Cuban. And okay. I mean, no insult if anybody's insulted. I, that's like a happy place and makes me really want to eat Cuban food. Sure. So because this is so fruity, mm -hmm. but it's not. To me, it's not too sweet. It has that really sharp um, tart thing going on. I think that would be really great with like a, a almost a fatty, rich meal, like sure. a rose con pollo or something that had that extra fruit, fruit element, like some pineapple or papaya or mango or whatever in there with it. Um, this would accentuate those fruit, fl fruit flavors that were in the food, but it would also cut the, the fat and anything and, and so sure, it'd be like sure. cleanser. So you could enjoy the food again more and then enjoy the wine again more. And that's part of my enjoyment of pairing wine with food is that the, the play between the two things, you it's like it, it enhances both experiences. At least that's my, my personal take on it. I cannot disagree. No one can ever tell you how you should feel. I feel this is pretty nice. I feel this is pretty nice too. Um, and the more I'm drinking it, the less disappointed I am that it, it is not carbonated. Yeah. Because sometimes carbonation just makes you burp. Fills your stomach. Yeah. You know, it's true. And, and then you you want to slow down. You don't want to drink as much, which is probably a good thing in most true. cases. But I'm really enjoying the travel. There is a bit of a path with this beverage of the different fruit notes coming in. Yeah, they do definitely come in differently. Cranberry comes in very front forward, then then turns into the darker cherry. And then towards the end is when I get the pineapple. Mm -hmm. And on the finish, I swear I'm tasting a little bit of pear, but I could be, could just be imagination because I know it's there. But the uh, the citrus hint pretty much stays with it throughout, keeping it like lightly floral almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's actually really, really nice. So we do have to start thinking about numbers. We do. And we do, we do two numbers. Yes. Two scores. One score is basically completely unbiased, okay? It is how well did this turn out as a brew from what was intended? 
Okay, so in this case, we have a little bit of a problem where we wanted carbonation. So we tried to carbonate, that didn't work. But is it still successful as a wine all on its own is the question, and that's where that score comes from. Then the second score is bias. Personal experience, personal enjoyment. What do you think of it? Our scores always go from one through 10 with the occasional 11. I do not think we could ever have an 11 for operational score, performance score. Yeah, I don't think that's don't even think possible. That's... 10 is just, it worked exactly as expected and did everything it was supposed to do and everything about it is perfect. And there's no 11. Um, 11 is personal bias. See, there's a difference there. So um, let's do the uh, performance score performance. first. Right. So this, this literally is just, did this do what it was supposed to do? Are there off flavors? Are there any weirdness? Did it stall? Did we have problems? Is there any reason why we might need to change the method that this was made in order to make it work better? That's what this is about. All right. Um, are you ready? I'm ready. One, two, three, nine. nine. Yep. If it carbonated, it's a 10. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I was I was initially thinking I'd just take a half point. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. it, ne it needs a full point because... Carbonation is kind of a big deal. This did not carbonate at all. And we went in from the very beginning intending this to carbonate. Right. Well, actually, it was about halfway through you suggested. And we went, oh, yeah, let's do that. That's true. Yeah. Right. We didn't intend this to be carbonated when we first make, came up with the recipe. But halfway through, we decided and we started aiming towards that. So, yes, it was intended to be carbonated. That's That's the truth. Yeah. Everything else about this is fantastic. The flavor profile yeah. is fantastic. The balance of acid, tannin, and sweetness is actually really, really good. Um, I don't think it's too sweet. I don't think it's too acidic. I don't think it's too tart. I don't think it's too tannic. Everything is great. It's got a beautiful color, lovely clarity. It didn't stall. It brewed really, it fermented super fast. Everything about it was great. If this had carbonated, it's a 10. Plain and simple. And you know what? We're gonna finish this, because why not? Uh, okay. And now, Let me reassess one more time. personal bias, flavor, enjoyment, that sort of thing. When I think of that, I think of, is this something that I would reach for? Is this something that I might pick over other things? Would I just pour this in a glass and enjoy it? Does it require me to do something special to it? Like, do I have to make it cold? Probably. Do I need to add ice to it? Do I need to mix it with something else? These are all things that add to my enjoyment because I am essentially a lazy drinker at heart. Meaning the easiest thing for me to put my hands on and put in a glass is probably the thing I'm gonna reach for first. So if I have to put addendums in there, I'm probably not gonna drink it. But if it's already in the fridge, where does that fall? Versus do I have to put one in the fridge and remember the day before you know, I'm going to want to, you know, it just gets silly. What? I'm just being truthful. I, I could add to that, but I, I don't think it's necessary. Right. <laughs> My favorite cocktail is a glass, two ice cubes, and whiskey. That's a cocktail. All right. All right. I'm ready. One, two, three, eight point five. 8 .5. What the heck? What world are we living in today? 8.5 by itself, a 9.5 with food. Wow. Okay. I don't know that I'd raise it with food. I think it's about the same for me. I might even go a little lower. I, I wouldn't, I, but I don't drink a lot when I'm eating. I just, right. I just really don't. He doesn't drink, like, he doesn't drink water when he's eating. No. It's food. And then I'll drink water when I'm And drinking. then beverage. Unless it's or something really like... dry or um, super spicy. <laughs> That's about it. Um, anyway, so I'm lower, so I'll go first. Why is this not a 10 or an even an 11? It's not my wheelhouse. Even though I like fruit punch, it's really not my wheelhouse. I'm not the fruity guy. I like more spicy, um, spiced things, herbaceous type things. This is good, and I really like it. An 8.5 is a strong score, okay? And I know I wanted to make fruit punch because I have the history with fruit punch, but I guess when I really get down to it, it's just not something I would reach for over some other things that we've made, which that is the whole purpose in that choice is... How well is it, even with it not being something that I would reach for, it's really, really good. That It's that simple. You said you like it better with food. Interesting. Well, I mean, I'm just speculating because we just, haven't done it. we just opened this. <laughs> this is the first time we're tasting it. But I, I am thinking that based on my previous enjoyments of pairing wines with food, that this would be really great with the food that I already mentioned. Um... 
And I enjoy that experience, that play between the two things. So I think that would heighten my enjoyment of this particular beverage. By itself, uh, part of the reason of why I like it so much is what's actually holding me back. That, hmm. that sharp tartness is so prominent that I feel like just drinking the full bottle of this by itself, I might just get a little annoyed with that <laughs> by the end. That doesn't seem to be bothering me. <laughs> and we we split this halfway. You see, Brian's finished his, and I'm I'm still nursing mine. That's not because of alcohol. That's because of that. that She's having a tougher time getting it down. Tartness is like. Now ah! that that actually brings up something interesting to me that I started to say, um, and that was convenience of drinking. I don't know that I would enjoy this warm. I would probably give this a much lower score warm, which means now I have to make sure it's cold or put it on ice, which dilutes it. That takes away a little bit. That's I think these are the things that go through my head when I start thinking of uh, my biased score. Now, part of our procedure here in our mini home setup is that whenever we make a cider or a beer or even something like this, that even though it's a wine, we bottle it in the smaller containers, anticipating that we would drink this more readily because we were it was going to be sparkling and so we're just like hey it's a refreshing drink right um so those bottles i do tend to migrate rather quickly into our mini fridges however this is the kitchen this is the most accessible room in our house we were in here pretty much most of the time of our lives and the mini fridges or in the next room over. So that was the thing I was going to add to Brian talking about how lazy he was. Well, that would be a seven. Then. If he could go right there to the, our refrigerator in the kitchen, no Maybe problem. Maybe even a five. As long as I had specific written directions and arrows with like neon signs saying, this is what you want. It's right here. And she packs the fridge. And then the mini fridge is there. I have there, no idea what there, anything there is. in that room. It's just, it's a void in there, so. I'm teasing, but I'm not. And no, she's right. We all we all have our little idiosyncrasies where we're just like, this is what I'm willing to do, and that's yeah. just too much. Like I said, I'm a lazy drinker. That's all. I'm <sighs> but anyway, this okay. We're we're talking badly about it, but in reality, this is a very successful wine. Yeah. I think it's a great recipe. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are going to love it. Now, here's an interesting thing: if you didn't want to carbonate it, you could just use regular sugar and pasteurize it, and you'd be fine. Or you could still use the non. Uh, non-fermentable sugars, and then just bottle it after it settles out. Bottle it, and you're fine. Either way, you're totally safe. But uh, that's about all we have for this one, right? That is, for now. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day. Bye-bye.